Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited that you're here to worship with us this morning. I want to invite you, if you would, to stand with me as we begin to worship and sing together. We're going to take a moment to just set our hearts and minds on the truth of Scripture. As we begin to read these words, I want to ask you and invite you to repeat with me what you see in yellow, and I'll read out loud what's in white. So let's do this this morning, just to settle our minds and hearts towards the one that we give praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's praise him this morning. Let's get our voices and our hands going. To sing to the name above all names. I praise when I'm sure, I praise when I'm doubting, I praise when I'm numbered, I praise when surrounded, cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning, as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray.
I'm going to ask you to repeat after me as we declare our praise together this morning. Let everything, let everything that has bread, that has bread, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything, let everything that has bread, that has bread, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. Give him praise this morning. We come to praise, we come to praise the name that has saved us from ourselves, that has shown us his love and his kindness. Let's sing this morning to remember those truths together. Remember those wars that we called sin and shame. That they were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died. Any roads, those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came anytime, any roads, those giants are dead now. Clear together, this is our God. And this is our God, this is who He is, and He loves us. And this is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He bore the cross and beat the grave, and let heaven and earth proclaim, This is our God, King Jesus.
A million angels fall Face down on the floor Hard to echo Holy is the Lord My heart can't help but sing With all of heaven roar Forever echo Holy is the Lord Oh, 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 oh. Forever echo Holy is the Lord Mesmerized by every heart Written in eternity Every lifted voice apart Joining in the symphony Our glory and honor Dominion and power Just fall face down on the floor. All to echo holy is the Lord. My heart can't help but sing with all. Let's turn to one another in his love. Let's welcome each other here this morning.
Good morning, Oakwood. Find your seats, please. Hey, good morning, Oakwood. My name is Dalton Shaw, and I'm the Oakwood Activity Center Director. And it's a joy to worship with you this morning. And I want to say thank you for joining us here at Oakwood to worship. If it is your first time and you are a guest, in front of the pew, or in the pew in front of you, is a green card that looks like this. If you will fill it out and bring it out to the west side, our information tables, we'd love to give you a little gift, um, get to know you a little bit, answer any questions you might have, and again, just say thanks for worshiping with us this Sunday. I hope on your way in you're able to grab a bulletin because there's a lot of information in it that we'll be covering some of today. Tonight, yes, tonight at 4 o'clock we have our parenting seminar. We've been talking about this a lot. We're super excited about it. Um, we are having McAllister's for dinner, so super excited about that too. Right now, registration is $25, and that lasts until 1 o'clock. After 1 o'clock this afternoon, if you still decide you want to come, which I encourage, it will be $40 at the door. All right, we'll still give you dinner, though. All right, but we do want you to get registered. We want to join with you to be empowered and equipped to disciple our children. This Wednesday, yep, this Wednesday, Commitment 101 is going on in this room to my left, your right. It's our decision room. If you have taken your first steps um, to becoming a member, you want to partner with us here uh, in membership at Oakwood. Um, this is the second step in that process where you get to dive into the life of the church. Pastor Eric will be leading that um, and answering any questions you might have. That will go at 6.30. Um, you can sign up online or in the app. Um, and if you forget to sign up, please just join us anyway. My notes say sign up or show up. So do that. Meadow Lake Fall Family Fun Night. This fall, um, we are going to capitalize on the fact that the weather is getting cooler and it's not going to be as hot and spend some time together in community at Meadow Lake. We'll be riding all the rides, um, the boats, putt-putt. They'll still have ice or shaved ice, um, which will be good. Um, that is October 8th from 5 to 7.30. All right, we want to join with you in community, in fellowship. So come on out, enjoy a nice, hopefully weather is nice, night. And before I continue, I was given a special video just for you this morning. Can you imagine a nightmare like that? Those glasses and the only decoration is a library sign? All right, that's what we're trying to avoid this year with our Light the Night. Our Light the Night is our alternative as a church when the world celebrates darkness and going door to door trick or treating. We set up in the parking lot with biblical themed parking spots to preach the gospel and hand out candy. But we need your help. 
So we need over 2,000 pounds of candy this year. Right now we have 65, but it's okay. There's still time, right? Inside the gap, there are a couple different buckets that you can put candy in. Um, we are having a competition for our favorite sports teams, so donate there, but we also need people to sign up for the volunteer spots. All right, um, we want to be a part with you, we want to join with you in making this Light the Night fantastic. Last year, there were over a thousand kids, and I can only imagine that that's gonna to continue to increase as people just get on, on board with, with wanting to have the gospel in their kids' lives. Now this morning, as we continue in worship, let's prepare our hearts to receive the word. Good morning, Oakwood. Welcome to part four of our series called The Church Defined as we look at the book of Titus. So if you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to turn there to the book of Titus near the end of the New Testament, so toward the back of your Bible. As always, if you brought your phone or a tablet or an iPad, you're welcome to follow along on there. If you'll download the Oakwood app, um, just search Oakwood Enid in your app store and then uh, download the app, go to sermon notes and all of the scriptures and everything will be there for you this morning. The main thing we want you to do this morning is to be engaged in the word of God as we allow God to speak to us this morning. In this series, we've been talking about the church defined because the book of Titus was written at a specific time to a specific situation. The apostle Paul writes this letter to Titus who has been uh, sent to Crete and is, and is in, in this place where all of these new and young church plants are happening. And so the church is growing, the church is young, it's vibrant, but it's got a lot of newbies in it. And the apostle Paul says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave Titus here in Crete and I want you to do some things. And he writes in this letter giving him instructions on how they are to do church. How can we be a church that God desires? This isn't a church that's a building. This is the church of the people, the people of God, the gathering of the saints. And so uh, to help with this, he writes this letter, and that's what we've been studying. We're going to continue in that today as we get to chapter 2. Now, the first uh, three parts of this we've been talking about, the first week we talked about how we are called to stand firm on the truth of the Word of God. That the Bible is the end all in all matters of faith and practice for a Christian and so we're going to hold up the truth of God. It is the final say in our lives. The next week we talked about elders. What is an elder? Who were these godly men, this plurality of godly men who are appointed to lead the churches there in Crete and lead the churches even today? And we talked about that. What does that mean? Looked at those qualities and those characteristics. And then last week we talked about how um, we, the, the, he was warning the church that legalism and false teaching could make its way into the congregation. And again, it was telling the church to wake up and pay attention and to make sure that we're studying everything out, to make sure that the truth is being taught, to make sure that you don't uh, do what legalism is, right? Legalism is when we take the Word of God and we take God's law and we add to it. We put some human traditions on there, like you got to wear a tie to church, you know, something like that. We talked about that last week. And then today we're going to continue uh, in our study because we are talking today about how we are called by God to be an example for others. We are to set an example for others. Let's read the text together. Titus chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. We're going to look at three verses today. It says this. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Now let's contextualize this just a little bit. Okay, Paul is talking to Titus here, and so he's addressing Titus here in verse 1. He says, hey, you, Titus, however, you must teach, not you ought to teach, or you could teach, or you should teach, but no, it's, it's, it's imperative here. You must teach 
what is appropriate to sound doctrine. In other words, we're going back to what, the, what is the truth of the Word of God, what is the truth of the Word of Scripture. And then verse 2, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. And likewise, just like you're teaching the older men, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. There's so much for us to unpack uh, from this text this morning. One of the things that we want to remember is that God, of what God has called us to as Christians, as he's called us to set an example. It was World War II And General Patton was leading a brigade of soldiers, thousands of soldiers actually under his command at the time across Europe. And the story goes that they came to a swollen river that had had been at flood stage. And the men got to the edge of the river and and Patton said, you got to go across the river. And they were to put on their packs on their backs and go across the river. And the men said, hey, we can't get across the river. We cannot carry these heavy packs. We're not going to make it. We're all going to drown. And the story says that General Patton, who was at the back of them, walked all the way to the front, came to the edge of the river. He put his pack on. He walked down into the river. He went across the river. Then he, he got to the other side, didn't say a word, turned around, put his, with his pack on, came back across the river, came up on the shore, and simply said to the men, follow me, turned back around, and went back across the river. All the men made it across the river the river that day but it speaks to this thing this principle that I want us to get this morning is that sometimes we are inspired more by example than instruction we're inspired more by example than instruction we are inspired more sometimes by seeing someone walk more than we hear them talk But then when you think about God's church, you think, where are the godly examples today? Where do we look for examples in our life of how we should live? You know, the culture would say, hey, we look at the famous people, we look at the wealthy people, we look at the social media people, we look at the athletes, we look at the politicians. (laughs) Yeah. Um, We look at Hollywood, you know, because they're so moral and upright. And those are the places where you're going to take your cues on how you are to live. But I'm telling you, we have an absence, I feel like, of godly examples in Christianity today. People who are just faithful that others will look up to and follow. And one of the greatest needs in the church today, not only Oakwood Christian Church, but I just mean the church at large today. I think one of the greatest needs in the church today is godly mentors. Godly mentors. People who actually exemplify their faith. That they will actually walk it out in this lost and broken and pagan world today. We need some mature Christians who will inspire people in their walk with God. Now, I want you to notice something from the text we read just a minute ago. From, from Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Did you notice right away that, that, was, that it's cross-generational? That, that he's addressing these churches, and the churches are already cross-generational. They're not a bunch of 20-somethings or a bunch of 30-somethings or... You know, he, he, he is considered here to be kind of at the same age range as Timothy. He's called a son in the faith to Paul, which gives you this idea that, you know, Paul not only was a part of his conversion to Christ Jesus, but that Paul was also actually, was actually older than him. So we don't know exactly the age of Titus. I tried to study that out. No one really knows the age of Titus, but most scholars believe that he, he is a younger man. And here in our text today, it says to teach the older men and to teach the older women. Now, next week when we continue in our series and we get to verse 4 and beyond, then it says that we're going to teach the younger women and also the younger men. And so we see that these churches from the very beginning in Crete are cross-generational. And in this cross-generational dynamic, Paul is asking Titus to teach the older men and women to be examples to those that are younger, to exemplify this Christ-filled life. But I didn't want to, I know that's not something that's really in the notes or anything, but I just wanted to point that out. That these, are, these are cross-generational churches, just like Oakwood. It's, it, it, it's, it's a bunch of age range and a bunch of people learning how to walk out this faith from one another. 
First thing from our text that we can get today is this, that teachers must teach God's word accurately and consistently. The teachers must teach the word of God accurately and consistently. Look at verse 1. It says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. You've got to teach the truth, and it's an imperative. You must teach it. It's not suggested. It's saying you are going to teach this. You know, I was thinking about, you know, if I were God, I doubt that I would continue sending people and growing a church and keep adding to their number if they didn't have a number of people who were examples and who were able to teach others. And I think that God has called a lot more people to teach in the church than are actually teaching today. Now, this isn't just an Oakwood problem. I think this is a church universal problem. But it can affect the outreach and the discipleship and the ministry of a church. I don't know if you remember this time, but it was about 15 years ago. We had a crisis in the airline industry. We had a shortage of air traffic controllers. I don't know if you remember that, but they were, counsel- they were canceling thousands of flights because of a shortage of air traffic controllers. Now, if you think about that, that's a pretty important thing. I mean, to get a plane off the ground, obviously, the first thing we look to is a pilot, right? We, we want, we want the, the guy with the most experience and the most landings and takeoffs and has handled the most turbulence. And, you know, we got to have a good pilot. you got to have a good ground crew because, you know, they need to fill the plane with fuel. You know, you want to be one of those planes that gets up there and, oh, I'm out of fuel already. got to circle back or gliding back to the runway. I mean, there's all these things and all these components which makes the airline industry work. But the air traffic controllers, and they're actually not, not hired by the airlines. They're actually uh, part of the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. But these air traffic controllers are the ones that are the leaders that are barking out the orders in the air. They're giving instructions to these pilots about, oh, right, you know, clear to land. On runway 17. Okay, clear, clear to land on 3208. We've got, we've got a plane on the tarmac. It's taxiing across the runway there. I'm going to need you to circle around and come back again. That's your 15-minute delay of circling in the air while you're waiting to land. But they do that. Why? They do it for safety. They do that because they're the instructors in the air. Those those air traffic controllers are the ones that are making sure that everyone's safe. They're making sure everyone gets to their destination safely. They're the ones giving the instructions. And you can see when, when there's a shortage of that, it affects everything in the airline industry. How much more in the ministry of God's church when we don't have enough spiritual traffic controllers? We don't have enough people mentoring and teaching and being an example to the flock. There's a shortage of it. And I know that some people are afraid to teach. Because when you put yourself in a position of influence and authority like that, sometimes people are going to come against you. They, they, they're going to come against the truth. They're going to oppose you. They don't want to hear that they are accountable to God for what they say and what they do. They, they, they don't like to hear that some things that they do are sinful and that they're out of line. They don't want to reflect on the fact that one day they're going to stand before the Lord God Almighty and they're going to have to give an account of everything they said and everything they did. And so I kind of get it. It's like, man, being a teacher, being someone that, that teaches others in the way of Scripture is not, is not the easiest job in the world, but it is necessary to grow people God's way. It's necessary to disciple and build up God's church. We need more teachers, but teachers must accurately Teach God's word and be consistent in it. And then he goes on in the next verse there in verse 2. And he gives us these teachings to the older, more mature men. It's specifically targeted, targeted to them. I did a little study on this. What does it mean when he says in there, teach the older men? And in verse 3, teach the older women. What did it mean to be older? Most of the time, what I found was that older was considered over 40. You know what that means? It means I'm older. Just realized that after studying this. Thank you, Lord. Uh, But here's the deal is like it's those of non-childbearing age is kind of like how how they saw it there. And so around 40 years old, they were saying, hey, teach the older men to be temperate, 
Okay, let's just read verse 3. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Teach these older, more mature men to do what? The first thing here is to be temperate and clear-minded. To be temperate and clear-minded. What it's saying here is that these older men would be an example to everyone to take life seriously. Not that there's some kind of killjoy and they're not any fun, but they know when it's time to be serious. They take serious their faith. They take serious God's work. They value what God wants for their life. That means that their life doesn't revolve around the next ball game, around the next hunting trip, next television program, the next activity that they want to go to. That they actually have spiritual priorities in their life and they are temperate and clear-minded about the direction of their life. And they take it serious and they model that for the younger men. Be temperate and clear-minded. The second thing it talks about there in the text is to be worthy of respect, to be dignified. Worthy of respect, to be dignified. I think that is so absent in our culture today, wouldn't you say? With the political climate like it is, we can't even have a healthy uh, debate on politics anymore before it just spins out. No one respects anyone. We're in this protest climate in our culture We have to protest everything. No one seems to be able to have a dignified, respectful conversation with anyone. And it seems like it's even crept its way into God's church. That Christians can sometimes not be able to be able to be respectful of each other, to lend credence when it is called for, to be dignified in their speech, and to be able to talk to each other. And how much more so do we see that reflected in the culture that the church should be called to be different than that? And that's what he's saying here. Paul is telling Titus here, hey, these older men, you need to teach them to be worthy of respect, to be dignified men, to make that a part of your culture as they are people to be looked up to in their faith. Which begs the question, are you worthy this morning of someone respecting you are you living your life in such a way that people look at you as one who is dignified third thing this morning is that these older men would be self-controlled that they would be sensible about their lives self-controlled sensible now if you notice you've heard this before right if you go over to chapter one this was actually one of the characteristics that was given to elders in verse eight Verse 8 says, rather he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And yet, here's the same exact quality from verse 8 brought over here to just the older men in the church. Not, Not necessarily them holding the position of an elder as a church leader, but just to Christians to say, hey, they are to be self-controlled. They are to be sensible. Because we'd read there in chapter 1 also that the Cretans weren't living this way. (laughs) It was part of the Cretan culture was to not have in practice any self-control. And sometimes, I think as Christians, we struggle to leave our past behind. And sometimes we bring some of the patterns and maybe even the sinfulness of the past into our future in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm one of those. I believe that there are some things that happen when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. That moment of salvation, there are some things that change in your life. I think sometimes the scales on your eyes fall off and you can just see things differently. You can, you can, you can have this relationship with God that now is, is much closer than it was before. And you feel the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Sometimes you just can't live the way you did before. You just, you just have this conscience that, that is just way more in step and in tune with the will of God in your life. But I also believe in the process called sanctification. Sanctification is a process, and it's the process of us becoming more like Jesus, the process of maturity, the process of us becoming more self-controlled and sensible. And in this process of self-control, I thought of a lot of areas of life that we need to bring under control, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's our mouth. Maybe it's our mind. Maybe it's those times in life where we get spun off, we get a little angry, we get out of sorts. Maybe it's in our actions. Maybe it's in our words. Maybe it's in our deeds. But we need to not let the past be governing our future. We are called to throw off things and to put on things in the Christian walk. One of those things that we need to grow in 
is self-control. And the older men are to lead the charge in this area. The fourth teaching to the older, mature men here is to be sound in your faith. It says there to be sound in the faith. To know what you believe and to walk firmly in it. That you will stand firm in your faith. That you will be one of those that will be a pillar of faith for others to look at. That the older men would be seen as these pillars of faith in the church that the younger men could look up to and say, man, I want to be like that person because they are solid in their faith. They know what they believe. They've drawn their line and they've said, you know what? This is what God wants for my life. And I'm going to stand firm in God's truth about it. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says this. It says, then we will no longer be infants. It's talking about infants in the faith. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. We're going to know what we believe. We're not going to just listen to the latest fad and just be blown around in our doctrine. It says, and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Because the false teachers that we talked about last week, they do this on purpose. Instead, it says, speaking the truth in love... We will grow, we're going to grow to become in every respect. In what respect? In every respect. Every respect? Every respect. The mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. That's what the older men are called. That in every respect they would become the mature body of Christ and they would be sound in their faith, know what they believe, and set that example for others. The fifth thing to teachings to the older mature men the fifth thing is to practice love to practice love says they're right the 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 second one from the end in in, uh, verse two there says that they are they are to be sound in faith in love and in endurance sounds so soft and gooey doesn't it the guys i was like oh you're supposed to be more loving well the word there is actually agape And agape gives us this idea of an unconditional holy love. It's not, well, you deserve love, and so I give it to you. It's not not a physical thing. It's not just a mental thing. It's not just an emotional thing. It's not just a feeling. It is actually a love of the will to choose to love someone in spite of themselves. In fact, agape love focuses on others rather than self. So many times when when people uh, come to us with marriage problems, a lot of times the core of the issue is you want to be selfish and you want to be selfish. You're loving each other with a love of the world, not God's kind of love. God's kind of love says, you know what, I'm going to put others in what they want and what they need in life before myself. And here, these older men are called to practice, to put into practice love. But I want to take it a step further because there's a wonderful section of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, that talks about this agape love. Actually defines it way clearer. So listen to this because this is what Paul is instructing Titus to tell these older men to live out. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. It does not envy It does not boast, it is not proud, it's not prideful. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, listen to this, it is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs, that kind of love. Agape does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Agape never fails. And the word used there in the text in Titus 2.2 is agape. A love of the will. A holy, unconditional love. And they're to put that into practice as they deal with people in their life. And the last one there is to practice endurance. To practice endurance. Practice endurance in life. Endurance in the faith. Endurance in Christian service. We have this dangerous practice here in America called retirement. 
Retirement gives us this concept that at the, around the age of 65-ish, um, it gives us the impression that productivity in life stops. That you, you just quit being productive with your life. All of your responsibilities now are to travel and relax. Travel and relax. Maybe play with some grandkids in there, but mainly travel and relax, okay? And the tendency is for sometimes people to retire from ministry. Retire from the faith. Now, I know the mentality here because some people are like, you know, man, I did my time and we got to pass it on to the next generation. Got to pass it on to the younger ones. I taught Sunday school for 17 years and it's their turn. I volunteered in the nursery all of those years and it's their turn. I was a youth sponsor in youth group. I even worked the fireworks stand and now it's their turn. And I did the car washes and I did the this and I did that. I served communion, showed up at 6 a.m. on Sundays to do communion prep and We did our time. Now it's your turn. But don't find that in Scripture. In fact, I think it's interesting that Titus here with these instructions from the Apostle Paul is first addressing the older men and the older women of the church and saying, practice endurance in your service to the Lord. I'm inspired by that in our elders we have an elder who is here first service who is on our elder board who still serves as an elder today. He's 92 years young. 92. He, I, and I, I didn't ask him if I could say this. I said it right in front of him first service. I didn't ask him anything. He didn't know I was going to say anything. But I'm inspired by him because he has shown endurance in his service as an elder to this church. He has every reason to retire. He has every reason to resign, to step down, because he's tired. His body's wearing out. The mind is is maybe fluttering a little more than it used to. He's kind of weary in the body, weary in the flesh. But he says, you know what? I want to be a good example. I want to finish my race. I want to be strong. And he does not realize what an example he is to me in endurance in his faith and his service to the Lord. And I hope that that's inspiration for some of you. Some of you that have maybe pumped the brakes, you've taken a step back. You're not mentoring anyone. You're not leading anyone. You're not setting an example for anyone. You're not teaching anyone. You're not leading anything. And you might have more time today than you did all those years you were working full time. And show this endurance in the faith and this endurance in the Lord and in service to the Lord. And to be an example in that. I know that that many of you would say, well, hey, the problem is this. That we need that vitality and that energy and those ideas of that younger generation. And I completely agree with you. But I would also say this. We need the wisdom and experience of those who are older. To have more life experience that could sometimes help us and mentor us in the ways that we walk out this Christian faith as a part of God's church. Then we get to verse 3. Verse 3 is the teachings to the older, more mature women. And notice what it says there in verse 3. Let's just read it. It says, likewise, just like he was talking to the older men, likewise, teach these older women to do these things, to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Notice the list for the ladies is a little shorter, guys. Okay, that's all right. It starts out there by saying that, that they are to be reverent in how they live. To be reverent in how they live. Any of you have ever watched the comedy called Golden Girls? You had the same reaction first service had. It was just a little giggle like, oh, yeah, I remember Golden Girls. Golden Girls was a comedy that was built on a on this premise that these older women were going to be irreverent. And that everything you expected them to be as mature women, as, as, as the women uh, of that generation and that mindset with their, with their gray hair and the, and the way that they dressed and everything, but they were actually going to be irreverent in the way they talked, irreverent in their relationships, irreverent in every way of life. And we sat back and it was shocking and we laughed at the Golden Girls. But that's exact opposite of what... Paul's calling Titus to teach them here in the scripture. They're calling, he's calling them to be an example to the younger women of reverence, of holiness, and of humility 
before the Lord, to be someone who is reverent and reveres the Lord in such a way that it gives the younger ladies someone to look up to. And ladies, you have no idea, but just because of your age and stage of life, there are younger women that are looking to you. They're taking their cues and their faith and their walk from you. And they're watching, how do you revere the Lord in your life? Be reverent in how you live. The second thing is to not slander others. Don't slander others. Gossip is a big temptation for anyone. That, that crosses generations. It crosses you know, genders. Men, men have a struggle with gossip too. Gossip is this big temptation for everyone. But here specifically, it's saying that these older women are to not slander others. It implies that maybe that had been going on. Slander is false and malicious statements that damage the reputation of another. It changes sometimes how people perceive others, and it can ruin relationships and ruin influence in lives. And most of the time, I want you to remember this. The slander says more about the slanderer than the one who is being slandered. As you may be allow your ears to be garbage cans sometimes. Remember that. And this is something that I feel like talking poorly about people behind their back, not talking to them directly, but always trying to work around their back. I've seen more lives and relationships destroyed by that in God's church than really any other thing. And it's sad because it can destroy families, it can destroy friendships, it can destroy relationships in God's church where there's this affront between two parties because someone went behind someone's back and slandered them to someone else. And it's pretty straight here. It just says not to be slanderers, to not participate in that. Then it's interesting what's next because what's next it says, or also don't be addicted to much wine. As I read that, I thought, really? It was the ladies? <laughs> you know, a lot of times we think, well, that's more of a male thing, you know? It's, it's, it's the beer culture or whatever, you know? It's, that's, it's more, you know, that was, that was for the older men, not for the older ladies. But no, it's specifically written here to the older ladies. I pulled some statistical data on that, and actually, uh, women who abuse alcohol is on the rise today. And they say the number one reason for that is numbing emotional pain. It's used as something to numb emotional pain. I think for many women, it started out innocently enough. It was just a little bit of alcohol, but then it was, you needed a little more to get the same effect, to calm you down, to give you the buzz, to get you to relax a bit. I haven't drank much alcohol, to be honest with you, in my life, um, but I have had NyQuil a lot. I was introduced to NyQuil as a teenager uh, when, I, when I was really sick. My mom gave it to me and did not say a word. And when I drank that, it was so warm going down in the throat. I was like, man, what is in this stuff? I mean, it's cherry, but my goodness. And you turn the box around, 25% alcohol content in NyQuil, 25%. And man, after you have NyQuil, I kind of like didn't care about you know, anything. That's why sometimes I have some couple shots of NyQuil before I come out and preach. I won't be nervous. And... <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. Don't tell the elders, please. <laughs> but seriously, didn't it start off innocent enough with alcohol with most people? Most people just didn't go to level seven of alcohol consumption. It started off innocently enough. It was just a glass of wine with a meal. You know, ladies, ladies, it was just glass of wine. But now, can you have a meal without wine? Do you have to have wine? But you cannot have this certain meal without the wine. Maybe it's just a little drink before you went to bed. It's just a relaxing drink before you went to bed. But now you have to have it or you cannot fall asleep. And you would say, well, you know, I'm not really addicted to it. But if you can't sleep without it and you can't eat without it, Maybe for some of you, you can't watch the game without it. You can't play another round without it. You can't do your favorite activity. Or when you get together with your friends, you always have to have it. That might be a sign. Don't be addicted to alcohol. Ephesians 5.18 puts it this way. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What that scripture is saying is that God intends us to be under no influence except God's Spirit in our life. You've heard of DUI, driving under the influence. The influence of what? Alcohol. 
We're to be under the influence of God's spirit, not the influence of anything else in our lives. And so, ladies, don't be addicted to alcohol. Don't be addicted to too much wine. And the last thing it says is, but to teach what is good, to teach others what is good. The older ladies are to be teachers to others of what is good. The literal rendering here is a teacher of goodness. That you value the good things in life, the pure things in life. That you are a positive person that speaks positively about God and his church. And you're not one of those that just carries on the bad things and the negativity of life. Now, I know some of you are like, that's a little Pollyanna. Yeah, maybe it is, but is it needed today? And is it what God intends? Last week we talked about Philippians 4.8, if you remember that. It said that whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, to think, to dwell, to set your mind on those things. And maybe again, as I said last week, it would be a good filter for you, ladies, for you to be teachers of good, for you to consider the things that are true, the things that are noble, the things that are right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, and that you teach and you dwell and you have your conversations focus on those things. Why? Because it edifies God, his church, and his intention and his spirit to focus on the good things of life that we know the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above. It comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Accentuate those things in your life. Because I know what it's like. Sometimes, ladies, especially as you get older, you can just rant and rave about everything, and I can't believe she's wearing that. I can't believe this, and I can't believe that. But exemplify those things that are good. Watch for those things that are good. Talk and dwell and teach upon those things that are good. Older men and older women in our text today are called to be examples. And I want to remind you this morning that no matter what your age is this morning, there is always a generation behind you watching how you walk. They're watching how you live. And there's so many of them that would love to have a godly example in their life. Someone, someone that, that just loves Jesus. Someone that actually is considered holy. Someone that actually will put off the old things and put on the new things. Someone that will have a godly witness and an example that someone else could look to and follow. Because your life is a life of influence. And your influence is like a rock thrown into a pond. It has these ripples that go out. Sometimes to spaces you can't see them. What you do in your life right now, it echoes into eternity for someone else. I know, you're like, whoa, that's a lot of responsibility right there. Yeah, it is. But that's what God has called us to. To be examples. To be Jesus with skin on to people. To be godly witnesses. And to live our lives in such a way that it brings him glory. Now, again, these principles today, they're specifically targeted at older men and older women, but I think some of us that are maybe younger in the room today, this is for you too. And if you thought it wasn't, well, guess what? Next week, it's to younger women and younger men. So stay tuned. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is living and active, that it teaches us so much about who we are supposed to be not just how we're supposed to act or how we're supposed to live, but who we are to be in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I'm just reminded this morning that that is the call of the gospel. It's to give ourselves fully to you, our attitudes, our actions, our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, our whole life, God. You want to be the Lord of all. And yet some of us, Lord, we live our lives in such a way where we will live for you in this area, but not this area. We'll live for this, but not for this. We'll, we'll give up this, but we're not willing to give up this. And yet, God, you've called us even higher to be an example to others of what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christ follower? So, God, I just pray any of us that have fallen under Holy Spirit conviction this morning would repent of whatever we need to repent of. Maybe we need to repent of the apathy in our life. 
But God, just that we can move forward in faith to live out these things that we learned today so that many more people can be affected for the kingdom of God. And God, to never underestimate who you could use. Yes, even us, Lord, you could use us to grow the kingdom by being a godly example for others. And so God, I just pray that you would help us to live that out. And Lord, if there's anyone this morning that's just trying to do, trying that pattern of do better, try harder without Jesus, Lord, it is not possible. We all know that. And so God, I pray if there's anyone outside of the saving knowledge of you, they've never called you Savior and Lord in their life. They've never made that decision to give themselves over to you. They've never tasted that watery grave of baptism. Lord, I pray that today would be a day where they would come forward at the end of the service and talk to someone about their relationship with Jesus Christ, that they would take that step toward giving and surrendering their life to you. Because Lord, it is a great life when it's lived in Christ Jesus. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for your word. And we just dedicate this time to you. We give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me in this moment as we come together under the name and the banner of Jesus Christ to declare that we will build our lives on his truths and his teaching.
One of the things I like about a new season, whether it's a new football season or maybe a new school year, it's a chance to just start with a blank slate, kind of a blank piece of paper. Because there's no history, it's just kind of whatever there is out in front. Our staff, we play uh, fantasy football every year, and, and the guys on, on staff like to have me in the league because I always finish last. But each year, when we do our draft, I, I start with, with new hope because it's a new season. And at least for week one, we're all the same. And it doesn't matter what happened last year or the year before. This is a brand new year that we get to start fresh. I thought about that when it comes to each and every week when we get to take communion. We get to start fresh with Jesus each and every week. Regardless of what happened last week, maybe there was some yucky stuff that happened in your life. Maybe there were some opportunities when you didn't live up to your standard, that you didn't keep your commitment to the Lord, that you disappointed yourself. Maybe you blew it. We don't have to wait till Sunday morning to get that fresh start, but this is a perfect opportunity during this time when we take communion to just say, okay, Lord, whatever happened last week, I'm giving it to you. If I blew it, I'm sorry. If I'm struggling with an area, Lord, I need your help, but this is a chance when we can just start fresh, start the week fresh with Jesus. We get that opportunity when we take and receive the Lord's Supper. Because we remember what he did for us on the cross. He took away all of the sins, the past, the present, the future. He said they're gone. So that means we get a blank slate. We get to start new. Fathers, we uh, take the Lord's Supper today. I pray that we just take the opportunities that we have right now to just confess any sin in our life, confess any times that we have stumbled and fallen, and Lord, that we just commit this new week to you, we commit this time to you. We ask you to help us through this week. And Lord, we just pause and reflect on what you did for us by dying on the cross, and we're so grateful for that because you give us the hope the promise and the assurance of eternal life with you in heaven. In Jesus' name I do pray, amen. As we continue in our worship today, um, we have the opportunity each and every week to also uh, give to the Lord as he's blessed us. We try to make giving uh, easy for you. You can see that we've got boxes at the back. You can uh, use the app, uh, the website. All the, the ways that you can give are on the, on the screen behind me. 
I want to ask uh, right now if, uh, if our guests that we have tonight, Chris and Teresa Roberts, if they, they would just come on up here to the stage. We have uh, Chris and Teresa Roberts all the way from Joplin, Missouri. And they are here tonight. Well, I'm going to let them tell you why they're here tonight and uh, an invitation to come be a part of what they're going to do for us. So my name is Teresa. I'm a professor at Ozark. I get to teach the children's ministry sequence of courses there. I've spent a long time in children's ministry walking alongside kids. This is my husband, Chris. He's a professional writer. He's written curriculum for kids also walked alongside kids for a lot of years. And so tonight we want to equip you parents in discipling your kids and encouraging you in those ways. I hear you say a lot of years and I realize that we are the old people that Eric was just talking about. Uh, but that means we have a lot of experience, right? Yeah. So we have a 15 year old daughter who is learning how to drive and then is the middle of all this girl drama. Pray for us, please. We know how hard it can be to be a parent, right? That's tough. But we also know that you, like us, desire more than anything else to draw your kids closer to Christ. And so tonight, what we're, this afternoon, what we're here to talk about with you all and, and kind of explore is this idea of how do we draw our kids closer to Christ? How do we be intentional disciplers of our children? And so we're going to take you on a journey from birth through 12 and in even a little bit into the teenage years about how can we be intentional disciplers of our children. So we'd love to have you join us this afternoon. We're going to be really interactive, try to be really practical for you and encouraging you in your walk with Jesus and alongside your kids. All right. Uh, you guys are in for a, a treat, 15-year-old uh, learning to drive in Joplin, Missouri, because I grew up just not far from there, Lamar, and during driver's ed, we got to take a trip to Joplin to learn to drive in the big city. Um, <laughs> kind of a little bit of a, a scary thing for parents, but we hope that you will plan on, on coming t uh, tonight. Uh, parents, grandparents, uh, this is a tough world that we live in right now. And there's a lot of, uh, of forces that are just coming against the family and our, and our kids and our job as parents and grandparents. So I uh, hope you'll come and, and learn how to uh, be a better discipler of our kids. I'm gonna ask you to stand and I'm gonna dismiss us today and pray for our offering. I wanna also remind you if you need to be prayed for, ministered to, some of our staff and elders will be down front here to minister to you and pray with you uh, immediately following the, the service. Father, we're just so thankful for the opportunity that we've had to be here today, to, to sing songs of worship, to hear your word proclaimed. Uh, Father, we just uh, are excited for the new week, the week that we have to serve you, the week that we have to influence others, to share the, the love, the message of Jesus. Lord, I pray your blessing on on the offerings that are given today, each tithe, each offering, Father, and I, that you'll just bless these gifts that are given. Lord, I pray for our, our parenting seminar tonight. Father, I just pray that uh, it will be a blessing and we will learn better how to disciple, better how to uh, function as parents in this world. And Lord, Lord we know that uh, the world is waging war on our families and our kids, and so, Lord, we need to do everything we can to protect them, to train them up in the way of righteousness and uh, serving you. We thank you for the opportunities this week, and I pray that we will be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week serving Jesus.